Kia ora everyone. Thank you very much for coming today and um, for, for welcoming us here. Um, a part of Show Me Shorts' strategy over the next few years is to work as best we can to connect with filmmakers and film lovers outside of the main centres because clearly New Zealand is a place full of very creative film loving people and it's very easy to just focus on the, um, the main centres where most of the production happens and we know there's a lot more we can do to connect with people like your good selves and um, Hannah who joined our team late last year is based in Christchurch so she is someone you're likely to see at events anywhere in the uh, in the South Island. Um, Jack and I are based in Auckland but we are going to be uh, delivering more events in this part of the country Hi there. Um, to, to just do our best to help um, filmmakers um, in any way we can. So today I'm going to be talking about festival strategy which is what to do with your film once, you, once you've made it, how to get it out into the world and also some things that you might want to think about when you're in the production process or thinking about a project to make because some of these considerations will or can inform what film you choose to make or some of the um, creative considerations you make. So just out of interest, could I have a show of hands of who here uh, have made a film recently that they're trying to get into festivals now? Okay. Cool, and who is uh, about to make a film or is considering making one in the next year or so? Very good. And has anyone here submitted films to Show Me Shorts before? And was that a frustrating experience because it didn't, didn't make it in? Sorry about that, I think if I, if I had made it in I'd probably know you already. Um, so I will also talk about what goes into the the selection process for festivals and it might help explain what, ha what happened with your film or, um, or at least why some of the choices we've made were made. So, um, as I said, I'm Mark, I'm the festival manager of Show Me Shorts. I've been with the festival for 10 years. It's uh, the 19th year of the festival now. It was set up by Gina Delavarca and some of her friends. She's still the festival director. Jack's the marketing manager handles most of our comms, and Hannah's the community engagement coordinator. Um, we also have special guest Hamish Bennett, a filmmaker who will be speaking a little bit at the end of the, um, the presentation about his own experiences with film festivals. Uh, give a quick breakdown of what we're going to cover. Um, so how do festivals choose their films? How to put your best foot forward to festivals with the film? What is a festival strategy? some of the common pitfalls and how to avoid them, what help is available so you don't have to do all this work yourself, and then personal perspective from, from Hamish. Now, I do definitely want to encourage questions and have an opportunity to go over things which maybe didn't aren't covered by what I've spoken about or particular um, things you want to hear more about. Um, I'll kind of stop a few key points through the presentation. Um, and try to address questions relevant to those parts and then um, keep things moving because there is a lot of information um, to get through and it's probably most efficient if we try to do that in, in order. Um, don't feel you need to make lots of notes. We will um, send everyone a copy of this presentation so you'll get the entire PowerPoint presentation and the links that are referred to so that you can actually just um, go directly to the websites to, um, to get those. You don't need to scribble down every URL you see on, on a slide. Okay. So, show me shorts real quickly. 19th year of the festival, we get about 2,400 entries from around the world. Um, about 300-ish uh, come from New Zealand each year. And we select about 80 films per year altogether between 20 and 30 of those are New Zealand films. Um, it varies a little bit from year to year, but um, that's the, the sort of scale of submissions that we, that we deal with. Um, and I've just come back from clermont Franc Film Festival and Market in France, which is the biggest uh, short film festival in the world. And one of the things that was really exciting about being there and talking to, um, to international festivals 
from, from everywhere is hearing how much hunger and excitement there is for New Zealand cinema. Um, the, almost everyone I spoke to there wants to see New Zealand films submitted to their festivals. Even if it's not right for the festival, they, want to, they still want to see what's going on in this part of the world, what our cinematic voices are that are different to the other films they, they get, and hopefully some of the information I can give you today will help figure out which of some of those international festivals are right for, for your films and which ones just aren't actually a good fit. Uh, so, how do festivals choose the films? So as I said, we get 2,400, that was last year, submissions. It will probably be more this year. It goes up a couple of hundred every year. Um, the, there's a programming team which is made up of um, trained volunteers. Most festivals work in a similar way to this, where there'll be a large group of people who watch films individually, and if they like the film, they'll flag it, and then it sort of goes to, to other people to, to watch, get second opinions. If they don't like it, um, it will get red flagged and probably won't get watched again. Um, we make sure that every film is watched from start to finish, so if it is submitted to us, it will get at least one complete watch. Um, some festivals don't necessarily do that, unfortunately. Um, that's I'm not saying that's a good or bad thing, but realistically, you can usually tell in the first two minutes of a film if it's likely to be a good contender for your festival. Um, so some festivals, that's as much attention as they'll give it because they might have 12,000 submissions that they have to deal with, which is the the kind of numbers that Clermont Ferrand, Sundance, and festivals like that, that's how many submissions they have to process. Um, so that's a kind of long listing thing. Um, the, once more people have seen them, it'll either then get kind of downvoted or, or upvoted, and that process continues till there's about, for us, probably about 300 on an unofficial shortlist, and then all the films are kind of put on post-its like this so we can see where, where in the world they're from, how long they are, and um, they'll all be on a, on a wall, and then slowly the programming team tries to fit them together into themed sessions. So Show Me Shorts programs by, by themes. Last year there was one called Crime Spree. All the films had something to do with crimes or sort of exciting action kind of stuff happening. Another one was called When the Spirit Takes Flight, because there was a lot of films that were about characters having a kind of spiritual experience. We don't know what those themes are until we see the films, and quite often there'll be amazing films that don't quite make it through because they didn't fit into themed categories easily. Um, and basically at that sort of shortlisting stage, and it's, it, you may have had films that made it to the shortlisting stage and not know that, um, all those films are completely programmable. They're all of approximately equal quality it's just what is going to make a satisfying movie-going experience for, for our audiences, which ones fit with each other to kind of tell an overall emotional arc of, of an evening. And then we announce those final selections. Uh, what are we looking for? So tone is really important. Um, it's both a variety of tone and a tone that is going to be satisfying for audiences to watch. Uh, you're probably aware that New Zealand has a, a, a tendency to make films that are quite dark. So we're always looking for films that are hopeful or funny or have a lighter tone to help balance that. It's particularly good if those are from New Zealand because it gives another flavour of New Zealand cinema. Um, quite often we have to get those films from international film because often the best, the best films from New Zealand are the really intense dark ones, so the intense dark films from other countries get cut and we bring the comedies in or the hopeful ones or the strange poetic films because they give you a, uh, an experience that's not completely bleak. Some bleakness is okay but you can't have too much of it. Um, length is really important, our maximum is 20 minutes but um, the shorter a film is the easier it is to program because when you're trying to kind of horse trade films around different programs or um, if you have like 14 films that would all fit, say, a crime spree theme, um, uh, 
if people are fighting over their favourite films, to keep a 20 minute film in, you have to sacrifice an 8 minute and 12 minute film. So if you have the 8 minute film, it's more likely to stay in there for longer because it will fit in to that program more easily or it might fit into several different programs and isn't going to completely blow out the length of a program. Um, heart is important. Um, by that I mean films that feel like they really connect to something genuine and emotional, um, that characters are real people, that it's a maybe personal stories or something which an audience will connect to. Um, it can have a really slick film that is really, really well made, but you don't actually care about any of the characters, or it's not a journey that people will relate to. That won't make it as far through a program as a film that's a bit rough around the edges, but is really authentic, really beautiful, and just makes you feel something. We also look for kids' films. With the one section we always have is our whanau friendly session, and we always want to have New Zealand representation in that section. Um, and it's always hard to find really good um, family films that 8 to 12 year olds will like. So if um, you have any of those, that's a really good thing to, to submit because there's fewer of them submitted, so there's less competition for those slots. You missed diversity. What's that? <coughs> you missed diversity. I missed diversity. Sorry, yes. Thank you. Uh, diversity, and this covers lots of different kinds of diversity. Geographic diversity is really important. For New Zealand films, we don't want them to all be Auckland films. Like, we want there to be films from Auckland, Northland, Christchurch, Nelson, Invercargill. It is um, really important for that to represent more than just um, inner city Auckland and Wellington films, which the majority of the New Zealand films we get submitted are. Um, so cultural diversity is important. We don't want it to just be one experience of New Zealand that's depicted on screen. We want to see as many different cultures and communities represented, and that's what our audiences want as well. Um, that also goes for international films. We want films from lots of different countries, lots of different cultures, lots of different experiences, not just, not just one. Sure. You mentioned you know, about 2,400 submissions mm -hmm. last year and 80 selected. Could you give us a sense of those in between stages, the long list and the short list that you said, well, any of these would, are of quality, but you know, in terms of how many films are in those sorts of middle selections? Uh, I'd say probably about half of the films would get watched once and then and that's it um, because they realistically aren't going to make it any further, they're just not right for the festival or actually aren't um, realistically good enough. Um, the, then that sort of gets slowly whittled down to something like 300 films and then on the last programming weekend that kind of gets whittled down to sort of 200, 150. Once it get, gets down to 100 it's really hard because they're all amazing and those last 20 or so films that people are fighting over it's quite difficult and quite often um, that's where these sort of things come in. Why wasn't your film selected? And um, at the stage I'm talking about now where, where things have been shortlisted, it's these last three things are the most relevant, where it might not make it through just because it's too similar to another film that's in the program. An example, last year, um, I'm not sure how, how many people saw the sampler session, but we had a, um, a film called Stella, had Ian Mewn and Elizabeth McRae in it. It's a lovely drama, had its world premiere with us, it deals with dementia. There was another film submitted that also had Ian Mune in it that also dealt with dementia. Um, and by really bad timing, that filmmaker made a very good film with a wonderful, well-known New Zealand actor um, dealing with you know, a recognisable theme. But there was another film that for whatever reason the programming team preferred or had already just kind of decided and found a slot for, and it's like, we have that film already in, in the section. Um, or it didn't fit into any of the themes. Um, it's an amazing international film last year called something like Passenger 57, something like that, um, that was, um, may have been nominated for the Oscar. It was certainly shortlisted. Um, it was one of my favorite films that was submitted. It, at many points through the stage was gonna be the like the first film that would be in a session, 
but the kind of themes we could fit it into, there was only one or two and there were only maybe four or five films that also fit into that theme. So all of those films didn't quite make it through because we couldn't build a whole program around including those films and they didn't fit into the other themes very well. Or the length made it hard to include, which I've already kind of mentioned. Uh, so that's actually um, something that's open at the moment for recruiting more programmers. It varies a little bit. Um, when a new intake has come in, it's probably about 15. Um, and then usually over a year or two, some of them leave and it gets down to about 10 or so, and then we expand it again. And um, they have a sort of a training program that Gina runs to make sure they understand the kind of tastes we're looking for, the considerations we have and then she kind of monitors their, um, their ability and they'll get assigned certain films. So, excuse me, like they might get assigned a batch of 10 films and those are the ones that they watch and another person's assigned a different batch of 10 films and then um, they'll, um, they'll watch some of each other's um, depending on what sort of films they've been watching lots of before. Um, and another, just quickly, another element that's really cool quick for cutting films out at the early stage is that it's just not cinematic enough. Um, we are primarily a cinema based festival so the film will have to look and sound really good in a cinema in between two big budget international films um, because if you have like uh, an American film with $100,000 budget, um, Hollywood actors um, on one side, uh, an incredible French film, um, on, on the other side, there's something that's you know, been at Cannes, and in the middle you've got something shot on an iPhone, set in a cafe, and it's kind of shaky, um, and you can barely hear the dialogue, it's just going to be really jarring for an audience. So um, it needs to be visually and audibly um, ex exciting to watch. Uh, so a couple of things to help put your best foot forward. One is, is your film ready? Um, if you are editing your film and you're kind of working towards a deadline for a submission, it's really easy to try to um, just rush it to make a, a deadline. And you might just make the deadline, but there's also a deadline the next year. And if it may well be that actually another month or two months of just refining things will actually make the film that little bit stronger. Um, you also need to consider that if you're submitting it right at the end of a submission process, that's when film, the film programmers are at their tiredest watching wise. Because if you submit early, like right now, when we've just opened our, our submissions, the programmers haven't watched films for four months or so, they're kind of getting excited again. So, oh great, what am I looking for? What's something that's going to capture my attention? Um, and if something kind of catches their eye, um, it'll be flagged, other people will watch it, it gets a conversation about it. If it's right at the end of the process, there's like 500 films to, to get through. Um, they've already watched two or 300 films. They've seen other films that have caught their eye or might have addressed things. It's, if they see something that's not quite ready, because it could have used a little bit more time to just polish things up, it's really easy to, to say, no, this isn't actually um, something I'm gonna fight for. Um, so yeah, don't leave it to the last minute. A good rule of thumb is if you have any questions about, um, about your film and whether it's in the submission process, and this goes for all festivals, check the website and the FAQs first before contacting with questions. We're always happy to answer the phone and or emails with, with questions. We do re work really hard to communicate very warmly and friendly with filmmakers, but it um, does get frustrating if everything that you're saying is just is, has already been compiled on a really simple list and it makes the filmmaker look unprofessional because they haven't spent five minutes looking through your website. It does, doesn't make you look like someone who knows how to make a film or knows what you're doing, you always want to look the most professional as possible when you contact any festival. So it's just a kind of good thing to bear in mind. 
we do accept works in progress, but they have to be ready for the festival. So if your film is very nearly ready and you're wondering whether to submit, that is a good time to actually pick up the phone or to email because if you have a film that really is just in the very last stages, like maybe it's got sound mix or some music to add, and you've got all that stuff lined up, but it's happening through July into, into August, but you've got, what we've got now is, is a pretty good representation of the film, you can submit that and we can say, yep, that's fine. We can judge it based on this, knowing that the music is gonna change. We can probably make a good assessment of it and we know it's gonna be ready by this date, that's fine. Um, have had phone calls the last weekend of June saying, I just shot my film, I'm editing it next week. Can I submit it? Um, I'll probably, I'll, I, I think I can be able to get it done by October. It's like, yeah, I don't think that's going to be a good film if you're rushing it that much. If, you, if you've shot it, that's great. Take your time, edit it, make it as good as you possibly can, submit it next year. Um, you're, not, if, you're not going to um, have a film that's a good representation of what you can do if you're rushing it that much for, for a deadline. It's, um, it's different with 48 hour film competition, those sort of things. That's a completely different scenario. Um, Show Me Shorts and most international festivals are not that kind of, they're not looking for those kind of films. They're perfect for um, a festival like um, 48 Hours or for, um, for YouTube. You won't find many festivals that those fit into really well otherwise. And a couple of little things that um, help your chances. It's not gonna make a big impact on your selection. The film is what is selected, but these are the sorts of things which help you look professional and um, when things are difficult and being argued over, you, it gives people another reason to fight for your film. So if you have a short relevant director's statement, that's like no more than a couple of paragraphs. When people are kind of arguing over what does your film, what, what, what's this really about? I thought it was about this, I thought it was about this. If the director's statement says, this is what inspired it. This is, um, this was a true story it happened to me. This was, X, Y, Z, this is what I'm trying to explore. It's like, oh, okay, that's, that's what this is. It does fit here. And this person knows how to talk about their film well, so they would be a good person in an interview with, with media. Um, people would understand what the film is. If it's something that's this long, talking about um, something that happened to you as a kid that made you want to be a filmmaker, but that has nothing to do with this film itself or is all poetic about how the film's about the human condition. Um, it's just sort of, it makes it look like um, the film is confusing. Um, photos are really good. Um, this photo we've used in countless places. Um, they had a really big budget, they're lucky, but it's, a, it's an example of uh, an exciting dynamic cinematic photo. If, you're, if you haven't shot your film yet, Make sure you get a photographer on set, someone who knows how to take photos, give them you know, a nice bottle of wine, 100 bucks, whatever, to, so there's someone there looking for good moments to actually capture it with a proper camera because you can, if, if we have those, we can also see, okay, this would fit in a glossy magazine, this would fit in a newspaper, we can use this film to market the festival, we can use these to market this film to an audience. Um, if it's all just grainy screen captures from your film, they're not going to be printed anywhere because all we can really do with them is put them on Facebook, has some value, but not a lot. Um, and same thing, sort of director's headshot, um, a really short, specific bio that's relevant to the film, it um, helps us. Uh, programmers figure out who they're dealing with is the, like who who is the director is this like who is this person how would their story fit within the story we're telling about the festival this year um, don't bother with cover letters like they usually have the a, a section for uploading one or sending a, a letter to a festival about why you've made the film or what you um, why you've chosen the festival um, I have never seen a situation where that was actually useful. It's the film, people are choosing the film, it, the, the letter doesn't even really 
get read that I've noticed. So save your time with that for something else. Uh, and the director's the key figure in that? Yes, in that equation. Um, I said this is a photo meaning, it's question time, so good, good thinking. Um, yes, and so in the, I would say, in a sort of director's bio or in the, one of the statement things that you have on Film Freeway, um, if, the, if there are other key team members that are, are, were genuinely significant for the film, like sometimes the writer, um, like say the writer is a, a published poet and this was an adaptation of their poems, that's a useful thing to, to say. But you know, say one sentence about that, not paragraphs and paragraphs. If the, um, the director of photography is actually someone who's made well-known feature films or projects that you happen to um, be cousins with and talk them into doing it, that's, that's a useful thing to, to state. But we don't need to know the whole crew. Um, a whole list of crew. Any other questions about this first sort of section of stuff I've talked about? I know it's a bit of an info dump, but are yes. Are you reviewing that all the time? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. So the programming meetings happen about once a month in person, and so one of the things that's, that they often talk about is, okay, what sort of themes are appearing? What are some of the favourite films and so, because then, if, if for instance, there was a lot of romantic films, um, really good films talking about different aspects of romance or, or love, and so, okay, looks like we've got something like this. this could, there's something that could be like a date night kind of session. It, um, we've got these three films that we all really love. Let's keep an eye out for other romantic films. And it might be that if, because of that, a film that as a sort of maybe and someone's watching it and they go, well, we are looking for romantic films, this slightly strange romantic film from Lithuania is a different flavour of that and it kind of would make it a little bit further up the, the, the food chain. So with that theme, when you talk about programming for a theme, and you say sometimes you've got lots of things that fit the theme, sometimes you don't have enough. Mm -hmm. It's a number of films. Ooh. Number of films, basically. So, a session of films for us is either seven or eight films, usually. So it's roughly feature length, but we try not to make it any more than a hundred minutes, because we find that any more than eight films or any longer than a hundred minutes, and you start to not appreciate them anymore. You're kind of waiting for the the last one or two to finish. So. Um, uh, the, if the, there's quite often like there might be 15 different themes we've got that we're trying to piece films together for and this film which uh, is an interesting relationship film um, and it also has it deals with queer identity and also has a crime in it and the father's kind of weird that there could be a f um, weird parents theme there could be uh, um, modern queer life theme. It could be uh, um, relationships gone wrong theme. So that's something that could move around in different themes depending on what else is there. Um, quite often there's a theme which has, like I said, maybe 12 or 15 films that could be in it. And it's like, well, which are the ones that best fit this? And are any of these, do any of these other films fit elsewhere so that you can kind of play sort of three-level chess <laughs> with them, it sometimes feels like. And sometimes something that feels like you have a perfect, what feels pretty perfect, but particularly with the New Zealand films, um, there's like, we try to get two or three New Zealand films in every session. Um, we have a different section that really needs a New Zealand film and go, okay, this one would fit. Move it in there, it's like, oh, and this New Zealand film would fit in this other section. And you've got these just five films left without any other New Zealand films that fit that theme. And so, do we have a theme anymore? Can we fit these somewhere else, or do these films go? Does that have a theme? I have no idea. Theme. Yeah. Are really good films. Because you said before you might have a really, really good cinematic film that's shot beautifully, that connects, but it doesn't fit anywhere. Yeah. So you would dump that. Yeah. That's a bit sad. 
It is sad. There's. Uh, Because then there'd be 300 films, <laughs> and there would be like at the moment we have sort of between eight and ten sessions, which um, is eight or ten sessions that we're trying to market separately, right, that we're trying to get audiences to. Um, that feels like we can get audiences for that number of films. Um, Clément Ferrand, where I've been, they have 350 films. Their booklets this thick, mm. and if, but they also have. Um, I think they sold something like 200,000 tickets over, over the week. So there are that many people there. Like I went to a session and um, 1,200 people, you have to queue to get in and like they'll have queues getting in to film their sessions at 9.30 in the morning. We don't have that population density to get that many people along. So if we did have that many sessions, they'd end up with 10 people in each of them. So it's hard. That's, it's a really hard part of the job. but. That, um, that's the really beast of it. Not specifically. So we do do partnerships with other festivals, um, but that tends to be for culturally specific programs. So each year we have a, a one country of focus. Last year it was Indonesia. This year it will be Germany. Next year it will be China, probably. And so we work with other festivals to help curate those sections. And uh, one of the other things I was doing in Claremont Fran was building new partnerships for us to share collections of New Zealand films with their festivals. Um, so recommend, either recommend things as a kind of ad hoc way or actually curate sections for their festivals. But the, the theme, the way we do the themes is a bit unusual in the festival landscape, particularly with a, like Claremont Fran, this many <laughs> this bigger program that's like international competition one, international competition two, French films one to eight. Like that's how the that's what the programs are labelled and there's not the same kind of um, different kind of curation that goes into them. Well I, I will move on. Um, oh and if anyone hasn't heard already, we'll be going to McCashins after this for a drink. Everyone is welcome to join us. We'll be there to answer questions, keep talking, keep the conversation going. So if there isn't anything, if we don't get to answer it, we we'll hopefully can then. So what is a festival strategy? This is an itemised calendar of festival submissions tied to a specific set of goals and a realistic budget. So this is where you figure out of the 10, 12,000 film festivals there are on Film Freeway which are the ones that are best suited to your film and to the budget you have to spend on them because you can take a really shotgun approach which is expensive and probably not going to get great result or you can have something closer to a laser, a laser focused strategy which will still have a lot of no's but hopefully more yeses and better bang for your buck. Um, this is what it looks like in a very small way. I'm going to um, bring, bring this up bigger on the screen. But it's basically uh, like a spreadsheet um, where you have a list of festivals, the names, what the dates of the festivals, like when they're actually happening, and their websites. You can find more information and check stuff, um, where it is, when the deadlines are, and what the, what the submission fees are and if there's any special kinds of programming considerations like it's an Oscar qualifying festival, there's cash money prizes, um, there's um, a development program um, so that you can do workshops with other industry people. Uh, now I've got this spreadsheet, open another tab. So let's get that. Okay, so this is a spreadsheet which we will send you a copy of or you can download from our website. It's a template strategy which we put together for filmmakers as, as a tool. So I'll scroll through it so you can see a little bit more, but it's here uh, January deadlines. So these are festivals with deadlines in January, in February, in March. You can see you've got some the fees here. So we've got, this is in euros because it's a European it's, a Euro, oh, it's Korean, but for some reason we've got it in euros there. 
Um, so you would then put what the New Zealand equivalent of that is, if that's a festival you want to submit to, and it'll total it at the bottom so you can see how much you are looking at spending and which ones you need to cut to bring it into a more realistic um, budget. And so this goes through sort of March, April, um, May, so it's a full year. Now this is a little bit out of date. It was put together a few, like in July 2021 was when it was last updated. So if you do use this, I'd definitely recommend checking the websites for deadlines and if the um, fees have changed, <coughs> but it's kind of a good place to start. Um, and then um, in this scenario, you can, so you're not deleting all the information because you might come back to it and decide actually that is a festival I want to submit to. You can sort of color code it. So you like, yeah, the green ones, yes, this, these are the ones that are really good for me. Yellow, maybe, we'll think about it. Um, blue, it's probably not worthwhile. And um, we use color-coded spreadsheets a lot at the festival. <laughs> um, there's other ways you can format or do things depending on how your brains work, but this is kind of the information that you would include in it. Go back to this. Okay, well, and festival life of a short film can be up to about two years. Um, that's a kind of useful thing to have in mind. So, um, usually festivals won't accept films that are older than two years old, unless uh, um, most major festivals don't because they want newer films. So. Um, that's, you should ideally be thinking about this before your film is finished so that when you are ready to submit you already know which are the ones that you need to submit to quickly and um, one of the reasons why this is really important is it helps you figure out which film festivals you can submit to with the early deadlines so you're not always doing it at the last minute when the submission fees are the most expensive. Where do you start? So we do have a bunch of articles for free on our website which help you go through some of the kind of considerations both when you're making a film and preparing strategy. They're in the um, filmmaker resources section of our website. But really what you need to do first is clearly identify what kind of film you've made or are making. Um, if it's a science fiction film, there's a bunch of festivals that just play science fiction films. There's also some major festivals that have one section which like Midnight Madness kind of section that will also play genre films, you know, horror films, sci-fi films, thrillers, um, but lots of festivals don't play those. So knowing that's what you've got means it's easier to figure out which ones are good, which ones there's just no point in submitting here because I'll just be wasting my money. Um, it might be it's a drama film dealing with two characters in their 70s, that's, that's good to know. If it's a film that's focused on exciting youth focused films, they're not really going to be programming films that are targeted to um, older audiences, where this is other festivals, which their entire point of being is to make films that represent older characters. So um, figure out what you've got. And so who's its primary audience? Same kind of thing. Is it appearing to young people? Is it appealing to older people? Um, is it, if it's a comedy that is very verbal, um, it will probably play well in English language speaking film um, countries, but even with subtitles, comedy that's based on words it doesn't often translate well. So trying to target Europe European festivals maybe because a lot of people speak English, Asian countries less so, it's probably isn't going to, the humour won't translate very well, but if it's a character based physical comedy sort of film, maybe it will, that translates better. And what are your goals with this? Is this the first film you've ever made and you want to get it out there quickly so that you can um, feel like you've achieved something and then move on to your next film? Is this your fifth film 
and it's really the one that you think is has your best chance of getting international recognition is it uh, is it something which you really want to um, to target towards craft awards like maybe there's an actor in the in the film and it's the thing that really makes the fest the film strong is this one performance some festivals have lots of awards some festivals have no awards um, these help you kind of figure out some of those ideas and like what does success look like is getting into a couple of festivals quickly so that you can then release it online with a couple of extra laurels but the main thing you're trying to do with it is to get it out that's different to trying to have a really long festival life where you want to get into as many festivals as possible over a longer period. Sorry, and sorry, I just wanted to ask yes. about the food that day. Yeah. Yeah, so um, it's, hard, it's hard in a way because we don't know what we don't know. So yes. There's over 10,000 film festivals, you know. Yes. So it didn't occur to me, for instance, that there's a whole film festival just for odd characters, you know. So um, if you don't know what you don't know, is the best thing with your film to look at all the different things that are in it, like an odd character, um, it takes entirely. It takes place entirely outdoors. Um, it's about a brother and a sister, so it's siblings. Would you just do a keyword search on Film Freeway for those keywords? I, that I would. I, I would ask yourself first, what is what is my film about, and why does it matter to me? And those are things which I'd say people to do. That's what they should be doing with their scripts, because the clearer you can identify that, the better you'll be able to answer any other questions around the film. So. The fact that it's got strange characters may not be relevant to it getting into festivals. The fact that it's like uh, this film is about climate change, um, but it's a parable based on these two siblings, and one of whom is trying to stop something inevitable happening, the other one has blinders on. It's like, okay, so. The theme is the environmental theme is something which you could use to target festivals because there are festivals that are very focused on social justice, environmental themes. Um, I see what for you're instance, saying. so the, the film festival that's about odd characters is probably a film festival that where the theme is it celebrates maybe quirkiness or difference or yeah, right, could be. Okay. So it's theme related. Not necessarily. They, there's honestly there's so many different yeah, ways, and yeah, like, um, so yeah. Let's park that question until I've shown you a little bit more about some of these because I think those um, some of that might be a bit a bit clearer. But it is a good question. And the last thing around here is how much do I have to spend? And I mean, have in both senses there, like how much do I need to spend, and also how much have I got to spend. Um, you can, is, um, minimum you would probably spend on a um, halfway decent festival strategy is $500. So $500 to $2,000 is kind of what to expect depending on how much you're trying to do with the film. And um, if you don't, if all you've got is $500 and you really can't spend anything else on it, that's good to know at the beginning of your strategy so that you don't blow it all on two really expensive festivals that are unlikely to choose it. Uh, and um, yes, as I mentioned on our website, which we'll send these links to, there's some good filmmaker resources on this. Um, how, do, how high do I aim is a really good thing to consider. Um, there are a few um, so-called A-list festivals like Venice, Cannes, Sundance, the ones which um, we've all heard of. And if anyone got into it, they'd go, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. And even people who don't know festivals well have probably heard of a little bit. They're the ones that get 12,000 submissions. And quite often, they might only play 15 or 20 short films. I think Venice, I think Venice is something like that. The, so it, um, the chances of being one of those 15 are vanishingly small. Um, whereas there are hundreds of really good, slightly, you know, slightly second tier festivals and I'd say at Show Me Shorts kind of level where they really look after films, really love short films, just focus on short films quite often but um, may not have quite the same um, glamorous name but 
will actually do a lot with your film and are probably cheaper to submit to and the chances of acceptance are a lot higher. Um, and this is a hard thing, but if you're brutally honest, how good is your film? Um, it's a really hard thing to ask for, for any artist to ask of themselves, but you, if you are able to gauge realistically this, like the cinematography of this, it's good, but there's no images in this that are like, wow, this is going to um, blow people away just by looking at it. it um, the performances are good, but I can see in myself there's a few moments that kind of don't quite sit right. Um, and is this a story that I've that they've seen a lot before? Because if a programmer has just watched a thousand films, yours is the thousandth and one film, is this really going to be one that is going to make them go, shit, I need this. I'm going to fight for this and I'm going to forget about that Oscar winning film I just saw because this is the one that is really connecting to me. Because the more honest you're able to be, the better you'll be able to aim where you go with the festival because there will be a festival that will that your film will be right for but it won't be right for a lot of them um, premiere requirements it's not that big a deal these days most festivals don't have a premiere requirement or uh, particularly will let you screen in your the country that the film was made in um, the, ch the the ones that do a premiere requirements are also the ones that are much harder to get into and you can stuff up your whole festival strategy by putting too much emphasis on trying to hold the world premiere for something that's quite glamorous because it might mean you you give up a few like four or five opportunities that it would have a pretty good chance of getting into to hold the premiere status for something that's later in the year that would feel like it would be amazing to get into but the chances of getting in are very 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 slim you miss all these these festivals and then you don't get into that one and then you have to change your strategy and you try again the next year to get into these festivals but by that time it's a year older um, it's it, they probably would have liked the world premiere but you know it's it's an important thing to think about and you know, short film festivals versus feature film festivals if a festival like so an example I heard about last week in Claremont um, someone was telling me about getting into South by Southwest, which is one of the biggest festivals in the world. It's in Texas, um, in Austin, and I was like, oh wow, that must have been amazing to go to. I was like, it was a pretty horrible experience actually. Um, I, th I went there so excited. The most interaction I had with anyone who worked at the festival was the five minutes I spent um, with someone, uh, with a volunteer giving me a lanyard uh, while we were in a line queuing up for uh, lanyards to get into other films. The whole time I was there, I didn't meet a single person who'd actually seen my film. It's like they're, they're focused on the big um, Hollywood name films that, uh, and the Hollywood stars that are there. We've got hundreds of films, feature film, feature film, feature film. Those are the ones that are getting all the attention. Short films are a lesser consideration. The f films it might be an amazing experience, it might sound good, but your film might not even be um, it'll just sort of disappear. Whereas short film festivals, where well, that's all they focus on, they're more likely to really look after you, to celebrate your film, to make it a good experience for you. Um, so when you're targeting the festivals, that's also a really good consideration. Uh, do you have a niche element? It's things like, is your film an LGBTQ um, film? Um, is it an indigenous film? Is it a specific genre? Um, or is there a really unique element in it because there's, there are a lot of niche festivals and it helps you figure out which ones um, are right for you. And forget about the deadlines behind you, look to the ones ahead of you. So you might have just missed a deadline for a festival that you felt like, yeah, that would have been the right one. Don't, don't um, get upset about that, just think about the next ones. There's another 12,000 festivals you can look at. It's use your energy. Um, on those uh, and yeah, how much does it cost I've kind of covered this already a bit but um, these are different some different platforms you can look to European festivals tend to be cheaper to submit to because they get more government funding um, so 
if you are trying to submit to lots of festivals than um, European festivals, you'll probably be able to submit to more. They still get heaps and heaps of submissions because they're cheaper, so there might be more they might be more competition for their slots, but um, American festivals in particular tend to be the most expensive um, because you don't get any government funding in America, <laughs> so they have to pay for their costs with submission fees. But if your film is better suited to an American audience, then that still will probably be a better place to concentrate your efforts. Um, I'll just really quickly cover fake festivals. Um, as I said, you'll get this resource and also a link to, our, to an article on our website which does, um, goes into this in a lot more detail. There's two kinds of fake uh, or scam festivals. Uh, fake festivals are ones where the festival doesn't actually exist at all. It's just a pure scam. Um, they'll take your submission fee and nothing will ever happen. Uh, a pseudo festival is one where They'll say, yay, official submission. Um, the screening of the award winners is on this date. There'll be a hotel room somewhere that's playing on a TV screen the award-winning films. You get your official selection laurels, but it doesn't actually screen anywhere. Or they'll say, and now you've won an award. Your tro um, here's where you can buy the trophy. It's $350, and but congratulations. Um, it's horrible, but there's a lot of that out there. Um, the website and um, some of these questions, which you can look at later, will help you spot those things. Um, but on our website, we also, if I can find the link, we have a list of recommended festivals, which are ones that we've vetted and can recommend as being proper, legit festivals. So here's the article on avoiding fake film festivals. Uh, and uh, this is going to festival strategy advice in a sec, but there is a list and the hamburger. Oh, thank you. List of international short film festivals. So this isn't an exhaustive list. Just because it's not on this list doesn't mean it's not a great festival, but. If you are really, if you feel like, oh, this festival isn't any good, you're not sure, you check here, okay. If it's on this list, we know it is a legit festival. I'm not gonna be ripped off. Um, and there's quite a few, I'm not sure the exact number on here, but um, this is a resource that filmmakers all around the world actually use because apparently not many other festivals have done this. And so it shows up on Google as, how do I find a good film festival? <laughs> it's the most popular page on our site. Okay, uh, let's pause there for questions. I know, like I said, it's a bit of an info dump, but any questions immediately on what we've just talked about? Did you say before, Mark, that you have relationships with some of the festivals? Yes. And are they some of these ones on the list? Yes, absolutely. So there's an organisation called Short Film Conference, which is like an international affiliation of short film festivals that was set up partly to help combat uh, pseudo and fake festivals. So there's a certain um, set of criteria that a festival needs to um, fulfill in order to, um, to be part of Short Film Conference. And I'm not sure what all of those are exactly, but it's kind of to do with the fees, the, um, the way awards are judged, um, and the transparency of the information that you, that you share. So if, um, and yeah, so if, um, there's a, a list of festivals that are part of Short Film Conference, and I think all, probably all of those are on that, that list. But um, yeah, if there are really dodgy festivals that tend to hear about it from other festival contacts, we'll keep an eye out for, for this one. Um, a classic one is if a festival is set up with a name that sounds really similar to a famous festival. So Sundance Short Films and they make a logo that looks like the Sundance logo. It's like, oh wow, and there's an early bird deadline. Oh cool, I'll get in. And it's like that might be a festival, like it might, it might be Sundance Malaysia. And it's, like it's, it's not actually a real film, it's a real festival that's just set up to um, hook people who are desperate because let's face it, <coughs> filmmakers were often really desperate to get our film seen. So it's easy to play on those emotions. Uh, 
Um, so I think things that things that have made sh that have, have built the reputation is um, the curation, the um, consistency of um, connecting with with audiences and having a really clear identity. Um, the getting the Oscar qualification um, helped. So the winners of our two best award, um, best film awards, best international film, best New Zealand film, are able to submit their film to the Oscars. Um, so the the magazine Movie Maker, which we've sort of mentioned a few places, um, who put out an article about what are the top twenty short film festivals in the world. Um, we had to submit information to them about some of the things we do, what the films we include, and what what do we do for filmmakers. And that was, and they put that article together and listed us as one of the top 20 in the world. Um, I know that one of the things which filmmakers really respond to, both internationally and in New Zealand, is how well we look after the filmmakers and how much we communicate with them, because a lot of festivals uh, seem like you're just dealing with a blank wall or a robot. Um, and if you look at the the comments that filmmakers leave on Film Freeway, because there's a kind of function of doing that, um, like reviews, that's a pretty consistent thing that they highlight is that we they feel like they're dealing with people even if we're in, on the other side of the world and we do our best to actually treat their film and them well. Um, Mark, would you say Film Freeway is the main port of mouth for yes. short films? Definitely. Do they do any vetting of any of these big pseudo festivals or do they just leave nope. everything up there? They leave everything up there. Yeah. Would you say the main indicator of a pseudo festival is that they don't have a physical screen because I've had lots of friends who've gone I've won best actor or best film from this obscure and I asked them Do, does it have a physical screen? No but we won best film oh, how did that Yeah, that that, that's a classic one so it doesn't have a screening that's a pretty good indication another classic indication is that um, they have heaps and heaps of awards and you have to submit your, your film into consideration for each one with a different submission fee for everyone. So it's like, I've got lots of awards. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah, I'd like it to be considered for best actor. Okay, $20. Yeah. Um, best, the script's good too. So yeah, but you want to consider it for best script, $20. And, and so you can end up something that doesn't seem like it's that big a submission fee. All of a sudden you paid over $100 to submit for awards for, and it's not actually going to screen anywhere and they have some process, might be random selection to, or it might be that they've given that Best Actor Award to everyone who submitted that. Like, how would you know? If one of the filters on Film Freeway is the top 100 review, are they, they're pretty safe though, aren't they? So to review a festival on Film Freeway, you have to have been selected. So you can't, there's one vetting thing they do is that you, you can't just get all your friends to, or, or bots to write a review. It does have to be selected. So it, it is a bit strange looking at that because you do see festivals. Like I think one of the ones I know is it might have even been Venice or something like that. There were only seven reviews for it. But that's because they don't really care how well they're reviewed on Film Freeway. They don't need to. So they don't ask the filmmakers to leave a review. and. I mean, it's not a reflection of how good Venice is this film festival and then there'll be a festival which has been around for one year that is in the top 100 and I think part of it is because it's it might be a localized festival so sort of like top of the south but maybe for this region of Texas and has 300 films um, included um, and all those 300 people are encouraged it might be that they they're told at every screening um, so review, 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 but that doesn't mean it's not legitimate because that's an event that happened and you can kind of tell by the reviews. It's like, I came up, it was great, I met the this was a really cool experience, it was my first film festival and I loved it. It's like, and there's one of those and then several things that look like bots saying, great festival, great festival, great festival, great festival, and then maybe be a little bit suspicious, but if it sounds, those are real people who have well, it's as best as you can tell, who have film freeway accounts who were selected and 
have left a review. So that's that's a one way of vetting. But you can also vet on from freeway. One of the selections is has physical screenings. <laughs> that's right. I don't know why they accept ones that don't accept that Film Freeway gets a cut of every submission fee. So financially, it's if they don't put a lot of resource into combating pseudo festivals, they make more money. But um, also, I would say Film Freeway, the, any time I've had to deal with them, they, they are really responsive, they are people, and they, they're really helpful. So I'm not saying they're just like this horrible monolithic company, but there are a lot of dodgy festivals on Film Freeway. Cool, uh, we'll move on so we have some more time and to, and to hear from Hamish. But so this is, this is kind of like, can you do it yourself? Because this is a kind of baffling amount of information to, to deal with. If you are doing it yourself, um, here are some resources for research. So there's the list of recommended festivals according to the New Zealand Film Commission. Um, those are the ones which in theory, if your film gets into, they, you're eligible to apply for costs to cover getting you there. doesn't mean they'll automatically do it, but if it's not on that list, there's not much point in asking them to, to, get, uh, to help you get there. I think they were, even they would admit it's a pretty arbitrary list. The fact that uh, one film festival is on the list and another one that's actually just as famous, just as good, might even have a better industry development program. The fact that one's on it and one isn't, they probably couldn't tell you why. Um, it might be to do with history of uh, maybe a personal relationship they had with that festival going back 10 years. It might be they screened a lot of New Zealand short films 20 years ago and that kind of put up in their highlighted radar. But that's one list to look at. They will tend to be pretty expensive, those ones, and um, ones that are hard to get into. So don't put all your eggs into the A-list festival baskets, so to speak, because um, you'll burn through your money really quickly and probably not have a lot of result from it. Um, there's the Show Me Shorts list, which I showed you already, the Oscar qualifying list, and um, the short film conference list that I mentioned. So you can be pretty confident that any festival on these are legitimate festivals. Um, and yeah, so there's literally thousands of festivals. Um, if, and if you're doing it to it yourself, it is really good to do as much research as you can. So look at their website, see if you can, most festivals will have their program from the previous year. Do the films in that program look like your film? Um, if it's, you know, this is particularly relevant for things like if you do have a particular genre, like, yes, I've got a really amazing experimental film. There's not much point in submitting it to Show Me Shorts. We don't play experimental films because they don't fit into themes well. <laughs> and it's like, what is this Scratch film about? Uh, like, they can be amazing. We might love them individually, but they don't. That's not how we program the films. So save your money for another one. Um, uh, does, does it look like it's a really arty, art house kind of vibe? European festivals quite often have a much more really grand artistic cinema bent to them. So films that are more what we might call conventionally narrative, which a lot of the films that we really like are. It tells us simple story, A to B, normal human characters experiencing life probably won't get into European festivals quite as much, or, um, or unless it's a festival a lot more targeted to that. So like if it's a science fiction festival based in Spain, science fiction films are good things to submit to them. Um, okay, so that. Now, you don't have to do it all yourself. So there's a couple of services available. Um, what we do at Show Me Shorts is once you've done a draft strategy using some of these tools, you can pay for Gina to review your strategy and your materials and give you detailed advice on that. So you submit the film, which you can do at a sort of, we'd recommend no earlier than picture lock. 
but it's okay if it's still having sound mixing and music changes because that is a good time to be thinking about these kind of things. Um, the synopsis, the photos, and your draft strategy. And then Gina will give written feedback on, um, on that. Um, recommend festivals to maybe remove from your strategy or um, ones you might want to add that you haven't been thinking of. And after you've received that and sort of digested that information, you can also get a half hour consultation um, by Zoom. Um, you can see on our website there's various um, uh, quotes from filmmakers who've used it, so you, they have found it really useful. Um, Gina, like I know a reasonable amount about this. Gina's been doing it for longer than me. She's like a really expert. She's on the executive of Short Film Conference. She knows most of the festival's tastes and can tell you directly what they are interested in and whether or not um, it's a good match. Uh, then there is also um, overseas distributors and strategists. This is a much more expensive um, service, but it will get you even more. So they will actually create a strategy for you. So you would submit similar sorts of things. Um, and these are just a few that I've mentioned. There's quite a lot of companies, but we've worked with all of these organizations. Festival Formula came to show me shorts last year and did some workshops in, the, um, in Auckland. Um, and so what they would do is actually provide you a detailed strategy um, from scratch. Let's say, so this is your, so your budget is $2,000. Um, they'd create a strategy for $2,000 of submission fees starting from the date you submit it. This is the first one you should submit to, this is the next one, blah, 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 blah. and this is a year's worth of strategy, for example. Um, it's pretty expensive. That, that costs, I think it's £1,000, so about $2,000 for them to create that strategy. You still have to pay the submission fees on top of that, and then there's sort of escalating services that can be offered around that, but you do get it, particularly if you um, are very time poor and can't do the sort of research you need to do to um, do this all yourself or uh, and you do have um, the money to invest in this, you can pretty much guarantee you will get a better result from th than just doing it all on, on yourself, is, by yourself. Is this just for shorts or is it for features as well? Uh, these uh, mostly shorts. So you can do this with features as well. I know less about that space, but I, I know there are companies that do that, and I know Festival Formula has started doing that recently, and I think Network Island TV do features as well, but I'm not sure that's just Irish ones. Now, one, one thing I'm going to quickly see if I can find is, so I'll plug this for a sec. I do have a strategy that they created. Festival Formula, I'll show you what that looks like. Um, can it's getting a little warm in here. Do you mind opening the doors or turning the aircon on? Yeah. Uh, moment. Let's see if I can just find this. So I don't know if any of you have seen the film Time Tourists. It's a uh, Christchurch-made science fiction film that was in the festival a couple of years ago. Um, so. Uh, Ian, who's the director of that, um, he went with Festival Formula and uh, he said I could share the strategy they created. Um, so I can find it. Sorry, I wanted to have this ready and I kind of forgot.
was something I hadn't didn't have ready. Here we go. I'll open this up and share it again. Okay, so this is what Festival Formula did for Time Tourists. Uh, so, uh, sure, so this is what um, Festival Formula created for the film Time Tourists as a festival strategy. Uh, it looks, I, I'm not 100% sure how, like the cost of this, but I think based on that kind of figure at the top that it was based on spending 700 pounds on festival submissions. So it probably cost about that much again to create the strategy, roughly. But they have created this strategy which um, shows you where to submit the films, um, where it is in the world. This is probably based on chronological order of when to submit. Um, where they are in the world is all these little color codes and I think it'll say if there's an award them like what they're looking for so yeah it's like the sci-fi shorts um, it's narrative short but it might fit into it for whatever reason uh, and so that was a total of 60 65 festivals in that strategy and you can see here the total sum of submissions was 884 dollars um, so it must, there must be a total here, but there's also all these different aspects that they've um, that they've highlighted. And this is a spreadsheet which would be updated as they went. So I guess you click submitted, 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 and if you manage to get a waiver for some reason or other, um, I asked Ian if he found this good value for money because um, he's had a festival, he had a film in this last year's festival as well. And he said, "Yep." It's, excellent value for money, got it into way more festivals than I would have otherwise, and I'm using them on my next film. So, Did, Have you got uh, a category that shows how successful they were at festivals? Uh, in, in this... So they, 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 that's where they were submitted to. Oh, I see what you mean. So how many festivals did it get into? They, yeah, there must be. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so I think it's this, oh, this yeah. one here. Yeah. So yeah. one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's out of the first, they got into half of the first 20. Yeah. Um, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. So third. yeah, got into about a third, which is a pretty good hit rate, which means those festivals were well targeted to the film. Now I must say, this was a pretty easily programmable film. Um, a lot of the considerations I was mentioning early about what would make something easy to program, he hit on the nail on the head really specifically. I think it's eight minutes long, science fiction um, with an environmental theme. Uh, it's really simple, um, it looks beautiful and it had really good marketing assets um, like all the images everything he um, had done all those things really well so it knew exactly what it was it was short and the tone it wasn't too bleak even though it was dealing with heavy stuff it still had a kind of beautiful emotional tone to it and um, it was really slickly made so it was very easy to say yes to and clearly was easy for a lot of other festivals to say yes to um, yeah, so like I'm not trying to just say yes, everyone should be spending all this money, but it's just going to give you an idea of what you can do and what different the different ways you can approach festival strategy are. Now, um, what was that? So it's a company called Festival Formula. Yeah, the ones who visited us, so know them quite well. So um, I'd be happy to introduce anyone to them. They don't accept everything that's submitted to them, so they'll only accept films they like that they think they can get onto the circuit, because they also don't want to rip off filmmakers. 
So um, I want to invite Hamish up. Are there any other quick questions from what we've just covered before I do? Went to something about the movie the other day and to show me shorts and it came up with three questions, yep. all based on gender. Yep. What's the right answer then? What are you looking for gender-wise? Oh, so th when that is um, one of the things that came up at Short Film Conference about five years ago was um, no one was really tracking um, the gender representation in their festivals. So um, traditionally, there's been a lot more male directors programmed than female directors. And um, you can argue about whether that's because of who's on the programming teams or who's traditionally had more resources to make the films, but it was just the evidence was there was like 80% of the films were written, directed and produced by men. And it was very hard to create any strategies as international festivals on how to address that if you don't have the data of what is what is submitted. So um, once you collect that data, you can say, well, in 2017, it was 80-20, 2019, it was 70-30, so some progress. 2020, it went back down again. Wonder why that was. It's more just a data tracking no, not tool. Not use it for selection of the movies? No. The, um, so we do, diversity is important. So one of the things when we're kind of at that shortlisting stage we would look at is uh, we've got, like, uh, is, there, is this a diverse slate or uh, is, is it heavily weighted one way or another? Are we hearing lots of different voices? If it all feels like they're all um, similar voices being represented, then we probably would look at are there any other films which will give a different flavour um, for audiences or a different expression of New Zealand culture. So uh, it's not something which puts you automatically in a different category or not, it's mostly a data tracking tool, but um, it is something, a gender representation is something which we interrogate at a programming stage, but only when it's kind of those final few um, that we're considering. Out of interest, and I apologize because I had to come late. That's okay. I missed this, but um, one of the big things that was talked about, I don't know if you were at the Power of Inclusion conference in 2019, the big global one. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember if I actually, I heard yeah. so much about it, I don't think I was actually. Yeah, so one yeah. of the big themes that came through there was that it's all very well saying, oh, we need to be more diverse, but if you're gatekeepers, people who are selecting the films at all these festivals uh, are not diverse, you know, and 20 years ago it's pretty safe to say what they would have looked like. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's still not a, a level playing field, so um, is that something Show Me Shorts is aware of, you know, in terms of who are the gatekeepers, who are the people yes. who are selecting the films? Uh, yes, yeah, so in our recent programming, a call for programmers, um, I can't remember the exact questions that were asked, but there was like um, voluntary questions about demographics, so that that could be um, one of the things that we would we would look at um, because uh, we we want to ensure that the people choosing films are as diverse as possible because that does it, we all have biases and it's important to have different sets of biases. Cool. Um, I want to invite Hamish up now so that we don't run out of time from the speak. Um, very lucky that Hamish. Um, kindly offered out of the blue to come and speak to us. Um, Hamish is a wonderful director of features and short films. Um, we've included at least two short films that he's... Uh, kia ora, kia ora koutou. Uh, ko Hamish Benetou, ko ingoa. Um, lovely to see you all here today and, and lovely to be able to kind of have a bit of a chat. And, and like um, Mark said, I'll, um, I'll just be adding my kind of two cents to the, uh, to the equation. Um, I certainly don't think I'll be anywhere as, as anywhere near as useful as Mark in terms of you know, talking about festival strategy and things like that, but, you know, I guess my experience is um, making short films and then moving into feature films um, and then kind of navigating that, that festival process. Uh, you know, if, if there's any value that you can get out of it, then, then awesome. Um, I thought I'd just start, and, and please stop me, Mark, if I'm kind of veering off on random tangents, and um, please, guys, also just feel free to ask questions at any point. Um, as I was saying, I've just been making a few notes now, just listening to what Mark has been saying. 
and feeling if there's any way that I can kind of contribute to the conversation as opposed to just kind of repeat what Mark said um, or, or, or speak about something completely separate. Um, but just to give you a bit of background with me, uh, I, um, well, I'm, I'm a teacher first and foremost. So I, I started off as a primary school teacher. I, I've, I've been teaching for about 24 years. Um, and it's only been in the last four or five years since I made my first feature film that I've kind of just fallen into full-time filmmaking. Um, it was never the intention necessarily, and I think that was quite a positive thing to be able to kind of make a, a natural transition rather than um, put all of my eggs in the basket of filmmaking. Um, I felt like I've always been trying to make films for the right reasons, um, and I still love teaching. I still manage to do it part-time. It gives me the balance that I feel um, I kind of need as a, as a, just as a person, but also as a filmmaker, I think. I, I, I tap into my, my kind of my teaching experiences all the time when it comes to not just writing, but directing. I think there's a really, really natural um, correlation between the, the two kind of careers. And, and to be honest, like I'm, I'm stealing from my kids all the time when it comes to writing. Um, you, know, you, you know, like the, the stuff that comes out of their mouths, I'm, I'm never going to be able to kind of create myself. So, um, you know, I guess if I'm talking about that from, from the point of view of you guys, um, I'm assuming most of you have probably got, got jobs that you do other than, than filmmaking. And like I see that as a real strength. I think tapping into the, the world that you have, that's a very unique life experience that you have, a very unique um, point of view that you have. So, so play to that. Um, yeah, so long story short, I, outside of teaching, I decided that I, uh, I, I would have a bit of a crack at writing um, film. I, was, I, I kind of stopped playing rugby and I was at a bit of a loose end outside of teaching and there was that kind of creative itch that I really wanted to scratch. I was really into English at school. That was my favourite subject. And um, so I decided I'd have a bit of a crack at writing. I, um, I ended up writing uh, Anyone Could Trial for Shortland Street. And, and so I ended up writing... Um, uh, a trial script for Shortland Street. Um, long story short, I ended up getting writing about five episodes for them, and I was really bad at it. Um, it didn't help that I didn't watch Shortland Street. That was probably the <laughs> that was probably the main issue there. But I, I remember when I was kind of writing my first script, and and, um, and it was about to screen, and I was really excited about that. I was going to have my name on TV and stuff, and and uh, I kind of um, told all my family and friends and. Honestly, when I saw the, saw the story, on t like none of none of my words were in there. Like I was a dialogue writer, they changed it all, eh? Um, and, and I guess like I, I kind of I, I kind of carried on. Like I struggled through for the next three or four episodes, but you know they very politely kind of gave me the shove after that, and, and for good reason because I didn't know that world really well. Like I really wasn't aware of the world that I was writing for, um, and I think as much as it really encouraged me to write more. Um, it, you know, writing the world that you know intimately is a real, that's, that's something you've got to be really aware of and something you've got to um, play to. Because I certainly didn't know the world of a small kind of health centre in West Auckland. Uh, it wasn't something I was completely familiar with. Uh, I ended up writing a script called The Dump, and The Dump was my first short film. Um, I ended up getting, we got $10,000 from Fresh Shorts, the first uh, year of Fresh Shorts, and um, got $10,000 to make this film. I knew nothing about filmmaking. I'd never been on, on set before. Um, the whole idea of, you know, the, the boom, the boom mic and things like that, like that was the big fluffy pole. Like I, even up until my, like my first feature film, I still get a bit confused by the boom mic and what the name was for that. But I certainly knew the world that I was writing for. Um, the dump was set in a dump. It was filmed, it was set over kind of like one day in the life of, of a, a young boy who's turning up at his... Um, at his, uh, his dad's kind of estranged dad's um, work, which is a dump. Um, it was based around, uh, you know, my childhood. Oh, my, my friend who works at the dump, uh, works at a dump in Northland, uh, just down the road from where I grew up. I just felt he was a guy that I, like I, I you guys have heard of Christmas in the Park in, in Auckland. He, um, he would have Christmas in the dump every year. And so he'd invite everyone around to come and have a, have a beer with him at, at, at the dump and he'd string kind of like lights up around his, uh, his shipping container where his office was. And I just remember going to that one year because he, he's a friend. And I just remember thinking, man, I, I, it's people like you I want to celebrate. And it's a world that I really, really knew. I knew him. I knew that world. And so I ended up making a story. He didn't end up being the, the lead character in it. His, his estranged son who I kind of made up became the lead character. But it was a world that I knew. And I think just touching upon what Mark was saying about, you know, I, I think, 
you know, it's really, really important that you guys steer your films towards the right kind of um, festivals. You're not randomly putting things out there, which is essentially what we did with the dump. Um, but I think it's also important to remember you don't put the horse before the cart, because I think if you're trying to be too analytical about, OK, I want to put something into Show Me Shorts, and it's going to be about kids because they're into kids' shorts. If you don't like kids, there's no point in making that, eh? Um, if you don't like telling stories about children, then don't make a story about children. I think you first and foremost got to tell a story that comes from the heart and then comes from a place of honesty and truth and, and a place of, of real knowledge before you start thinking about those, um, the festivals that you need to be kind of putting them into. Because, and then Mark would have seen hundreds and hundreds of short films and it's very easy to see when something's coming from a really, a, 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 a heartfelt place and an honest place. And, and it's also easy to see when it's not. And so I think those are things that you've got to kind of think about before you start thinking, OK, I'm, my film's going into Sundance, and so I'm going to be really, really focused on, on getting there with that. Um, yeah, so, so the dump we ended up making, um, and that had, that had a, bit of, a bit of success. We, like I said, we, we, uh, we just kind of quite haphazard with the way we put it out there. And so we spent way more money than we should have spent on, on film festivals. We submitted to a lot. I see it's not up there now, but without a box, without a box, it doesn't exist anymore. That, that's where we did most of our um, submissions. So spent quite a bit of money on that. But um, probably the best thing that happened to us, is, as much as the film was, it's pretty rough around the edges. You, you'd be able to find it online if you want to have a look at it. Um, it certainly came from a place that felt honest for me, and, and tonally it felt like the right kind of story for me. Um, and then we, uh, we ended up getting shortlisted by Sundance. We never got into Sundance, but we got shortlisted. And what was really cool was that their head of programming ended up putting our story out, uh, send, uh, sending our film on to a whole lot of their other kind of second tier film festivals like Dallas and places like that. And we ended up getting to Palm Springs, which was our, I think our premiere. Um, and, and it kind of got the ball rolling from there. Um, we were lucky in that Sundance kind of did the job for us, but what you're hearing from Mark here is super useful because it's kind of you're avoiding all of that legwork and you're kind of targeting the places that you feel your film and your, your, your tone and your sensibility kind of appeals to, I guess. It's a gamble trying to get that to happen. It's an absolute gamble, yeah. It was purely pure luck that, that, we, that, that happened that... We, like, we had heard of Sundance, we'd heard of all the big ones, and we thought, oh, let's just submit to them. Um, <laughs> not, it was just very just kind of throwing it out there, and, and luckily someone kind of responded to it, I guess. Um, based off of that, we made a short film uh, called Ross and Beth. And Ross and Beth is, again, the dump was filmed, uh, set and filmed 200 metres down the road from where I grew up in the dump that, that my friend worked in. And Ross and Beth was set over the road from where I grew up. Um, it was about an old farming couple, uh, and they were, their names were Ross and Beth, who were based on my, our, our old farming, our, our neighbours from when I was growing up, whose names were Ross and Beth. And, um, and I just, I guess it was, again, wanting to tell a story about people who I, who I really love who maybe aren't always focused on. Uh, they're, they're an old farming couple who had very little nice things to say to each other, but you could tell that underneath all of that kind of that banter um, was a real deep loyalty and a deep love for each other. And I spent a lot of time with them, me and my brothers going over there and having cups of tea with them and helping out with the milking. And, and so I just thought I'd like to make a story about them. And it kind of grew from this concept of uh, imagining if Beth was to suddenly go, um, how would Ross cope? And that, that, was the, that was how it kind of started. And because I was writing from a place of truth and I understood exactly how Ross would re respond, um, that, came to, that, that came, I wouldn't say it came easily, but it came truthfully. Um, again, with that, with that story, we, we, had, we had success. It was um, with both the dump and, and, um, and Ross and Beth, we were lucky enough to get into Show Me Shorts with, with both of them. Um, it, it won a few awards, and, and, and I guess from there was that idea of... Uh, because they had a bit of success, the Film Commission were quite keen to kind of um, back us. And uh, long story short again, sorry, uh, we made Bellbird, and that was the first, uh, first feature film we've made, which essentially took the dump and Ross and Beth, combined them together into a feature film, and there you go. That's, that's what we did. Um, did the Film Commission handle the submissions and strategy for Ross and 
Yeah, so Film Commission, because we, are, um, we got funding from, uh, from Fresh Shorts at 30 grand, uh, they did handle some of them. Uh, so they handled um, the, the main festival submissions, I think, um, and anything extra from that was up to us, what we wanted to do, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so that was the, the general process, process with that, yeah. Uh, sorry. It's, oh, it's not, eh? And that's, a, that's, like, when I say that, like, we submitted, um, with the dub, yep, that was the first short that we submitted, but it was the first year of Fresh Shorts. Um, the next year, the dump hadn't come out, the next year we submitted Ross and Beth, um, and it didn't even get shortlisted at all, um, and submitted pretty much exactly the same script the next year after that, and it got, it got accepted. Um, there are so many variables in this. Whoever's your reader, there's so many variables in it. And I think you've also got to remember that you're going to get way more um, denials than you are going to get successes. And I think for, for us, it was recognising, no, we have a nice story here. Um, and I think we were lucky in that because the dump had had a little bit of success, um, we, we were going to be looked at a little more closely the second time around because uh, stri we we'd submitted Ross and Beth straight after the dump. R the dump hadn't been finished. We just kind of got, um, yeah, got pushed to one side. And that, that's, that's the way it is. That's, that's how it is. Um, Did you find yeah. that Ross and Beth played in the same festival? Uh, a little bit of both, yeah. A little, little bit of crossover there. Um, oh, what, what do we do in it with Ross and Beth? I think probably the one thing that one festival that I was really keen to get into was Melbourne because um, Melbourne had um, a lovely kind of a nurturing kind of workshoppy thing for young filmmakers, uh, short filmmakers, which we didn't get into with a dump. Um, but again, it, it wasn't a, a fruitless kind of exercise missing out with a dump because the short film programmer from that time, and I've forgotten his name now, but I think he's still there. He had seen it, he enjoyed it. And he obviously took a second look at Ross and Beth when it came through that second time, you know. Um, yeah, so, so that was the process with those. And I, I mean, I guess we're from a festival point of view, like we, I end up, we ended up making Bellbird, then we made Uproar last year. And um, so that's been the process that I've kind of, I, I guess I've gone through. Um, in terms of the festivals, I, I think probably the thing that I'd like to say, and I think it's kind of what I was saying about the, the script as well, I think the first thing, when you go to these festivals, it's just a lovely experience. Enjoy the experience for what it is. I think that idea of, of like, networking, it's a terrible word, and schmoozing, that's all a terrible word too. Like, I think, I think the first thing you need to do with, with a film is obviously make a film that matters to you, that's important to you, that comes from a place of honesty before you start thinking about the festivals you're going to go into. I think you've got to approach when you're at a festival the same way. Um, Approach your connections with people and your relationships and your chats with people as genuine chats, you know, like it's, it's a chat first and foremost. There's nothing worse than having those chats, you've probably had them before, where that person is looking over the shoulder of you for the next person who's going to be more useful um, to them in their chats. And it's happened to me and it stink, it feels stink. And I think it's probably not how you'd approach life in general. So don't approach that in festivals that way. I, I think you'd be surprised at the connections that you can form. And it may not be, may not lead to your next film, but it may just be, a, first of all, a lovely relationship that you formed. But secondly, it could end up coming at it in a sideways kind of a way. Like I, we, uh, Uproar was at uh, South by Southwest last year, and um, I met a friend of a friend uh, over there. He was, um, he just came along to watch Uproar, and he had no connection whatsoever to the, to the film industry. Uh, he's a, a mate of a mate. And um, we just got on, similar sense of humour, real nice guy, and, and we just ended up chatting. And even though he had no connection to film, he was a writer. He had done mainly travel writing, and um, he'd write little, little short stories for, like, um, The Big Issue, and, and, and um, he's an Australian, um, and, and, like, publications like that. And, you know, I, I guess if I'd looked at this connection with him as thinking, oh, you know, you're not going to further my career, um, then nothing would have come of it. But he ended up, we ended up staying in touch, and he sent me through a, a couple of his, um, of his little kind of anecdotes, I think, because they're only, they're like, you know, one-page kind of uh, stories. And they're beautiful. They're, they're really, really cool stories. And I felt sensibility-wise, we kind of aligned, and, and, um, 
and again, he's a good person, and that's such an important thing. It's a, he's a good person. Um, and, and now, long story short, again, sorry, I keep saying that, we, uh, you know, we're now collaborating on a couple of stories for an Australian production company. Um, he's, never written, he's never written a script before, but I know he can write. And, you know, the, 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 the structure of script writing and things like that, you can learn that stuff, but telling a story that comes from a place of truth and a place of heart, that's, that, that's, that's, that's the special thing. That's what you've got to look for. And so whilst, you know, like I said, he, he had no connection to the film industry, um, and he certainly didn't approach me wanting to get into this, it's kind of turned into a thing that, that whilst it's early days, I, I hope we can make some stuff together in the next, next few years. Um, so I think that's, that's another kind of example, I think, of um, making sure that, you know, when you get your, your amazing films into these, into these festivals that you, um, that you enjoy the experience for what it is and you'll be surprised at where that possibly could lead um, as opposed to being trying to, you know, uh, okay, I, I need to get from here to here to here because this is what's going to get me to, to, to this, this feature or whatever. And I think it's one thing that, that uh, Mark and the team at Show Me Shorts do really, really well is that they embrace short film as an art form in itself. And that, that's, that's a really important thing. I think short films, I think being able to tell a story with brevity and tell a story concisely where every moment counts, that, that's an art form. And it's, it's quite different, uh, quite a different process to making a feature film. And I think embrace it for what it is. Don't see it like it can be a stepping stone to a feature, but don't see it just as a stepping stone. See it as just you know as a an amazing experience and and, and, a, and a like I said an art form in itself. Um, I've probably wired on a bit too much, eh, Mark? That's all good. All good. Um, yeah, yeah. Any questions, guys? Please, uh, please hit me with them. Are you going to have some pub later? Uh, I'm not. I've got to get back to my phone. That's actually one thing that I do want to say is that I. Uh, so I, I've been living in Tamaki Makoto for, uh, for ages, uh, for uh, eight or nine years, and for the last two years I've been in um, Rarotonga, uh, where I did a bit of part-time teaching and, um, and had a lovely experience with my whanau. But we're now living in La Moturi, um, so we're, we're not too far from here. Uh, my wife's family comes from down here, um, and, and you know, long story short, we felt it was a bit, would be a really important um, to be with her family now. And so... Being a part of this community is, is um, this is my this is my community now, and so whilst I'm not going to the pub, I'm I'm not too far away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you remember the talks then? What's that, sorry? You remember the TSF, the local group here? Uh, I I don't think so. Maybe I am. I'm not too sure. Who, who's uh, I've I've I've. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I I, I, I think I chatted uh, a few years back at at one of the one of the. Um, Online chats, I think, but no. What's yeah. Top of the Sounds South. Like top of the South, yeah. Like, I, I think I'm part of the Facebook page, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, guys, on that two way, that's the other thing. Like, I think Mark said it really nicely that, that idea of that they don't want all of their films to come from Auckland. And whilst beautiful stuff comes from Tamaki, I think um, there's, there's real strength and the fact that you come from an area where not a lot of people come from, not a lot of filmmakers come from. I think you've got to embrace the fact that you guys come from a place where there's less people and there's less filmmakers. Your take on life and the people that you grew up, uh, they're, they're unique. And, and you li live a life that is, is unique and different to what, what is, is there in Auckland. So I think you've got to embrace that <laughs> and, um, and, and play to those strengths. I think um, knowing what it is that makes you unique is a really important thing. I truly, I'm a big believer in that idea of the more specific you make something, the more universal it becomes. Someone said that, it might have been, I don't know, James yeah, Joyce or someone. The stories are and the place you make yeah, totally. I, you make them, the absolutely. Them. Absolutely. The, the more, yeah, the, the more yeah, focus it is in the specific area. Whilst you may think that the, your experience is, is um, no one else will connect with it, they will. They will. I think the... Um, you know, like there's someone out there who is going to, whilst they may not have had exactly the experience you've had, will um, will connect with it in some way. So, um, yeah, play to it, guys. Play to it. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs>